Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to start off with our second weekly video. And in our video today we're going to talk about from Brown Girl Dreaming to Jacqueline Woodson. So whenever we talk about this work, first of all we have to analyze the background of the author herself and then we're going to analyze the historical background of the story itself in regard to the author and then lastly we're going to basically move on to first close reading to basically analyzing craft and structure. And as you can see here, this is a breakdown of the week itself, starting off with the author's background and we get to a deeper historical context. And then we're going to move on to first reading. And then lastly, we're going to link our close reading with a proper summary. So let's start off by talking about Woodson's uh, basically life. So she was born in Ohio in 1963, the third of four children. When she was a child, her family moved to South Carolina and then later to Brooklyn, New York where Woodson spent her adolescence. Woodson has written over 30 books. Most of them were about children. And then actually she moved on to picture books, to novels, and then has received numerous awards for her basically work. Now we're gonna link actually Woodson's own work with the historical background at that time. So Brango Dreaming takes place in the 60s and early 70s during the civil rights and black power movements. The civil rights and black power movements were both social movements that aimed to achieve equal rights for African Americans. The civil rights movements that led by Dr. Martin Luther King actually focused on nonviolent protest as a means of ending racial segregations and discrimination. And now, whenever we talk about the Brown Girl Dreaming, we talk about certain key facts. So first of all, it was published in 2014. The setting actually combines the several basically places, Ohio, South Carolina, and Brooklyn. The point of view was basically a first person narrative from Jacqueline's own point of view and perspective. And lastly, the genre is a memoir. And in our next slide, we're going to talk about the genre more specifically, and we're going to link the genre actually to the author's own and personal experiences. And now let's highlight actually the uh, genre that the work basically highlights. So it's a memoir, and it's known for its lyrical and evocative prose. While the book doesn't heavily rely on onomatopoeia, it does use actually various literary devices, including sensory language and imagery, to convey the themes and the basically personal experiences of the author herself. So onomatopoeia is a figure of speech in which words imitate the natural sounds associated with the objects or even actions that they refer to. As you can see in our first and close reading, we're going to tackle a lot. We're going to analyze the craft and structure of the basically the work itself. We're going to talk about line breaks, repetition of phrases, use of sensory images. We're going to talk about italics in writing and the writer's own approach and even attitude in certain stances. Now we're going to move on to the concept vocabulary. However, the concept vocabulary is embedded in the genre itself, which is a memoir. Now, why is it classified as a memoir? So first of all, because it's um, a written account of the author's own life experiences and even memories. It is a first person perspective, basically written in the first person narrative or point of view of the writer herself. It's an autobiographical, basically content. So it talks about the author's life, basically from her childhood uh, till a certain basically level in her life or age in her life. It is a personal reflection that actually conveys a lot and shares a lot about her thoughts, feelings, and emotions. It has specific basically and focused themes. So you're talking about identity, race, family, and storytelling at the same time. Um, and lastly, it has that sense of time and place, as you can see. A vivid picture of the different basically places and time periods in which Whitson's life unfolds. Now let's basically summarize our week by saying that sensory language and imagery help writers create a more vivid basically and realistic depiction of sense characters and emotions. By appealing to the reader's senses of sight, sound, taste, touch, and even spend, writers can paint a detailed and immersive picture that actually allows readers to experience the story more deeply.